Today we get to Athanasius and the Athanasian Creed. And uh, we're going to begin, first of all, with Athanasius of Alexander. If there was one, if there was one uh, title, if there was one phrase that summarized his life, it was contra mundum, against the world. You'll see why. Athanasius of Alexander, in my own mind, reminds me very much of Calvin. Of course, you know, Calvin desired to live the quiet life of a scholar, but by divine providence was thrust into the world stage, front and center, and was unable to avoid the controversies that God put him in. Likewise, Athanasius desired to, uh, he actually admired the aesthetic life. In fact, uh, one of his first books was a biography of a man named St. Anthony, and St. Anthony was uh, one of the first, uh, we would call a monk, he was one of the first aesthetics, and uh, ascetics, and he um, lived out in the wilderness, and people come to visit Anthony and, and uh, learn much of his uh, ascetic way of life, and Athanasius wanted to live a life of quiet contemplation and asceticism, but divine providence would prohibit such a quiet and contemplative life. Athanasius becomes bishop in Alexandria, and listen to the date, A.D. 328. Three years after what great event? Council at Nicaea. Three short years after that momentous event, Athanasius becomes the bishop of Alexandria. Now, the Arian controversy, of course, as we noted last week, did not die down just because of the Nicene Creed. And so, although uh, Athanasius was Alexander's deacon and played a very significant role, really in 328, Athanasius really enters into the fray as the primary main opponent of the Arians. There would be other opponents, for instance, Ambrose of Milan and others would be outstanding opponents of Arianism. But it would be Athanasius who would be the leading opponent, and he would be the one who would play the center role. Now, Athanasius was a man of small stature, but he was a giant. And in fact, he was such a formidable opponent that the Arians accused him of virtually everything under the sun. They accused him of immoral conduct. They accused him of illegally taxing the Egyptians. They accused him of supporting rebel forces to overthrow the throne. They accused him of tyrannizing dissident bishops. They even accused him of breaking the chalice of a rebellious priest. And in fact, the greatest of all charges was they accused him of murdering another bishop. When the charges were brought forth, he was also charged of having cut off the bishop's hand and keeping it for occultic practices. Athanasius, with all of the grace of a true man of God, successfully defends himself of all of these charges and in the greatest display of all, in the midst, and you can imagine when the, when the prosecuting attorney, so to speak, says, uh, brethren, bishops of all of the Roman Empire, Athanasius is a wicked man. We know as a matter of fact that he has killed Bishop X. And in fact, we have evidence that he has Bishop X's hand and he uses it to practice the occult. And when Athanasius stood up, he said, exhibit number one, please bring in the bishop. And they produced the bishop who was supposedly murdered. And then, of course, Athanasius had him raise up his arm and show everybody that his hand was still attached. Now, <clears throat> Athanasius does end up being condemned by the Synod of Tyre. And actually, after uh, the condemnation of that synod, which was obviously primarily Arian bishops, Athanasius has to escape for his life. Athanasius will have to escape a number of times in the course of his ministry. 
But Athanasius is, uh, was, a, was a, a sort of a strategic kind of person. And in the course of his escape, he waits for Constantine on the road leading to the newly founded capital of the East, Constantinople. And so there's Athanasius. You can also almost picture it in your mind. He knows Constantine's traveling to Constantinople. He's hiding out, waiting for Constantine to get there. And then he jumps out into the road and stops the uh, imperial entourage and demands a hearing with Constantine right then and there. Constantine welcomes him into uh, his uh, vehicle. And uh, by the time Athanasius is done with Constantine, the emperor completely exonerates him of all charges and condemnation. That wouldn't stop the opponents. In 335, he's exiled again to Germany. This is shortly before Arius was about to be reinstalled. And then after Constantine's death, you remember from the lesson last week, Arianism grew in strength, especially with one of Constantine's sons. And so one of Constantine's sons, Constantinius, would be one who would exile Athanasius a few more times. In 337, Athanasius is recalled to Alexandria. And then in 339, the Synod of Antioch, which at that time, you might remember our, our uh, lesson when we looked at Antioch, which at one time was a very uh, a bulwark of, of uh, conservative, what we call evangelical Orthodox Christianity. By this time, it was Arian territory, and he is ordered to um, um, appear, and he is again exiled, this time until 346. Now, through some maneuvering, Julius, the bishop of Rome, recalls Athanasius with Constance, Constantine's other son, ends up calling a general assembly in what is known today as Bulgaria. When Athanasius shows up, of course, all the Arians think that he's still exiled. When Athanasius shows up, all the Arians leave, forgetting that they had an important meeting to attend. And it ends up being a very significant event. Then for the next 10 years, beginning around 346 AD, Athanasius labors in Alexandria defending the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ as it was expressed in the Nicene Creed. Now in 355, there was a great synod called in Milan, Italy. Athanasius and his supporters were categorically denounced and condemned as heretics. Once again, he is exiled, and before he can be arrested, he escapes to Egypt, where he is viewed there as a hero. Now, it truly appeared that the Arian heresy was about to, in a sense, uh, once again overwhelm Christendom and even defeat all of the labor of the Nicene Creed. And in effect, by doing that would undermine the truth about the person of Christ. But something interesting happened in the providence of God. While, uh, while uh, Athanasius, the great defender, is um, uh, being exiled back and forth, uh, God in his providence brings about, in a sense, a civil war among the Arians. Because not even heretics can agree all the time. And there was, uh, within the Arian camp, uh, a brand new debate that started between, well, how similar is Jesus to God? You had what you might call the hardline Arians who said, well, he's not really similar at all. He's a very different substance. And uh, then you had the what we might call the softline Arians who said, no, we actually like that homoi usios thing, that similar substance. And we think the substance is pretty close, but not exact. And so within the uh, heretical camp, there developed a huge debate, and, and it almost ended up being a, one of those things where a city divided against itself cannot stand. And so the Arians began infighting over this debate. Now in 361, something very interesting happens in the course of the Roman Empire. Remember you had Constantine, who became a Christian. You had Constantine's sons who ruled. 
they, of course, also embraced to, to more or less degrees of orthodoxy the Christian faith. They were not hostile to the Christian faith. But then Constantine's grandson becomes emperor. And um, in 361, his grandson takes the throne. And you can tell just by his name that things are not going to go well. He's known as Julian the Apostate. Julian the Apostate becomes the emperor. <laughs> you know it's not going to go well for the church, right? But really, all Julian wanted was just um, for the old paganism of Rome to be revived. He at one time had embraced the faith and rejected it and kind of thought it would be good for the Roman Empire if the, if the old paganism could just kind of come back and we could have a revival of paganism. And so what he did is he thought what, what the most effective way to um, let paganism have free course is if I can get the Christians to start fighting. It's a pretty good strategy, right? What's the best way to get the Christians fighting? I'll bring back Athanasius. If I bring back Athanasius, he, of course, will start a fight, and then uh, they'll be so busy fighting that I'll be able to uh, reinstate paganism of course, his, re uh, his recalling all of the banished Orthodox bishops was not out of the kindness of his heart. He obviously was trying to release a hornet's nest, and so Athanasius comes home again. Of course, Athanasius was not known for tact nor compromise. And he saw right through what Julian was doing. And so Athanasius realizes that there's another front of the battle, and it's not just with the Arians. It's with paganism. And so Athanasius begins incessant attacks against paganism, which really irritates Julian the apostate because that's not what Athanasius was supposed to do. And so Athanasius is exiled for a fourth time. Now, Julian is so irritated by Athanasius, by his boldness and what really seems to be rudeness, religious rudeness, that he decides that upon that exile, he would send assassins to kill Athanasius. So, here's Athanasius. He's exiled. Once again, he must have been a master of escape because he jumps into a boat with some friends and they head down river, obviously probably going back to Egypt where he was very welcome. And Athanasius notices in the distance of another boat following their boat. And he realizes that in that boat are soldiers. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the soldiers are coming to do him harm. And so Athanasius does what was completely consistent with Athanasius' character. He demanded that his boat be turned around. And he headed straight towards the boat carrying the soldiers. And it's dark, of course, it's night. And as they come up, one of the soldiers says, Have you seen Athanasius of Alexander? And Athanasius replied, Yes, you're quite close to him. And they said, Thank you, and moved on. <laughs> After this exile, Athanasius, of course, returns again. And he finds out upon this return that God himself had raised up many, many young men to take on the cause of Orthodox Christianity. Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nanzianzen. And Athanasius realized that God really had raised up some outstanding men. By the way, those men would be known as the Cappadocian Fathers. Athanasius would continue to labor against the Arians and the semi-Arians, arguing that if Christ is not very God of very God, there is no way he could have died for the sins of the world. Well, Athanasius is exiled a fifth time in A.D. 365, and he returns again. This one is a fairly short exile, but we need to remember that it, by this time, he is absolutely worn out. But from 366 to his death in 373, he continued to live and labor and fight for the truth of Christ. One uh, church historian says, 
his enthusiasm, his steadfastness of purpose, his unbending and high-minded resolution to yield to nothing made him the commanding leader of his century and a permanent force in the history of Christian thought. Now that is quite an epitaph, isn't it? That is something else. Here is this man who had deep convictions and paid for those convictions and was willing to pay for those convictions time and time again. Now, what exactly was it that drove Athanasius? In your notes, B, his theological convictions. You can basically summarize his theological convictions under, under four heads. And the first was this. Nicaea must be defended at all costs. Now, remember, when we say Nicaea, we are not just talking about some sort of political thing that came about because of Constantine that, in, that resulted in a creed. When Athanasius said Nicaea had to be defended at all costs, what he meant was that the truth about Christ, which was articulated and defended at Nicaea, had to be defended at all costs. To say that Christ is very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, that that is nothing less than biblical Christianity, and it had to be defended at all costs. There was a proposal, of course, in the midst of all of the controversy during Athanasius' time of, as bishop. And the proposal was that a new creedal statement be made. You can imagine how this thing was going. There's so much fighting and so much division and, 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 and that desire for unity. And so many of what we would call the orthodox proposed that a new creed be made that would be a little more inclusive. Sounds very much like today, doesn't it? Just make it more inclusive so that more people can put their, 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 their names on the page. And Athanasius was convinced that any, any defection, even in the slightest, of the Nicene Creed would be defection from the cause of Christ. And it would be fatal to the church. And so Athanasius withstands the proposal and ends up having Nicaea reissued, which would happen again in another ecumenical council in AD 381 in Constantinople. Second theological conviction of Athanasius. He believed that you needed to defend the truth with Scripture. That remember, some of the other church fathers, for instance, even Arian, who certainly wasn't a church father, a heretic, to be sure, but remember how a lot of them were very prone to, to introduce philosophy into their perspective. And certainly nobody is, is free. We're all children of our own culture and age, aren't we? And in fact, I imagine church historians will look back to our age and they'll be able to identify certain philosophical and cultural influences that, that permeated our thought today. But as far as Athanasius was able, he believed that to defend the truth required the, the exegesis of Scripture and an appeal to the whole of Scripture instead of doing what the Arians did, which was to proof text everything. Athanasius believed in taking the passages, building up the theological arguments, and then blasting the error. That may sound pretty normal to us, but that's not how a lot of the church fathers argued. And so Athanasius stood firm on using the scripture to defend the truth. And in fact, let me just say that the, there were two main arguments that Athanasius would use against the Arians again and again. And the first was this. The Bible teaches that God alone saves. And he would appeal to, for instance, Isaiah 45, 21 and 22. There is no Savior besides me, says the Lord. And he would point out that there was no, no other Savior than God himself. God alone saves. And with that, the Arians could agree, right? 
But then he would point out, based on the exegesis of a passage like Matthew 121 or Luke 211, that Christ himself is the Savior. You shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Luke 2.11 Unto you this day is born a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so Athanasius would, would, would take these passages and say, do you see the obvious conclusion of the passage? God alone saves. Christ is the Savior. What's the only conclusion you can come up with? Christ is God. And it was, a, it was an argument that Athanasius used and used strongly. He did the same thing with another type argument. God alone is to be worshipped. Can you support that from Scripture? Of course you can. You better be able to. Give, give me one passage that teaches God alone is to be worshipped. What's that? The first commandment. You don't have any other gods before me. It's clear only God is to be worshipped. And so Athanasius would build up text after text after text. And then he would move to the second premise, which was Christians worship Christ. And of course, can you demonstrate in the scriptures places where Christ is worshipped? Absolutely. Over and over and over again. And in fact, in many opportunities, Jesus would have had to say, don't worship me, worship God. I mean, doesn't Peter do that when Cornelius falls down at his feet? Right? Doesn't the angel do that in the book of Revelation when John falls down at his feet to worship him? Don't worship me. I'm a bondservant of God just like you worship God. And yet over and over and over again in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is worshipped. And so Athanasius, after building up the scriptural arguments, would say, God alone is to be worshipped. As Christians, on biblical authority, we worship Christ. What's the only conclusion you can come up with? Christ is God. Christ is God. The third conviction of Athanasius is obvious. One needs to be willing to suffer for the truth. For Athanasius, truth was never merely academic. Do you know that, that for people like us, and you know the kind of people I'm talking about, people like us, there is a danger of truth, the truth of Scripture, the Bible, doctrine, of being just academic. And so that we almost have a sense of self-satisfaction that if we're able to cross our theological T's and dot our theological I's accurately, uh, and if we're able to articulate certain propositional truths, that that's all we need. And Athanasius, although he believed wholeheartedly in the necessity of orthodoxy and embracing the truth, it was never merely academic. The truth was something that you needed to suffer for. And, and here is the bottom line. If you are going to live for the truth of Christ, then you most certainly will suffer for the truth of Christ. It's easy for us to, make, to, to disjoint those two things, isn't it? Because there just simply isn't enough opposition around us to compel us to see that those who love the truth will suffer for the truth. But you ask our brothers in the Sudan, or in Indonesia, if there's a correlation between loving the truth and suffering for the truth, and they will tell you that there is. Athanasius was absolutely willing to suffer for the truth. Now you need to realize, here's this little slight man, small man, small stature. And in one of these synods where the Arian bishops had, had demanded his presence, one of the bishops stood up and he said, Athanasius, the whole world is against you. And you can imagine the, the, the drama of this bishop trying to bring the full weight of having the world against you. The whole world is against you. And Athanasius stood up and he says, well then, Athanasius is against the world. Contramundum, against the world. And for him it was that simple. 
If the whole world was going to go down the path of Arianism and Athanasius was the only one who would hold to a Christian orthodoxy, then so be it. When you have a conviction for the truth, you need to also have a conviction that sometimes taking a stand for that truth is going to cost you something. And one of the reasons we suffer so little for the truth is because our stand for the truth is so weak and anemic. Four, it was his faith and courage that would end up laying the groundwork for the Athanasian Creed and the Creed of Constantinople, 381. We need to realize that the fruit of this man's labor has been codified for us in these creeds. It also brought about the ultimate defeat of Arianism as a threat to the church. We dare say that, that God used a number of instruments, but let's be frank about it. Athanasius was the point on the spear that God used to drive into the heart of Arianism and bring it to an end. Stop and consider Ari uh, uh, Athanasius was bishop for 45 years in Alexandria. That's a long time. We have a, another 35 years to go, and then we can say Borgman was pastor at Grace Community Church for 45 years. It's a long time. But out of those 45 years, 17 of them were spent in exile. Let's stop and think about that. 45 years of Bishop of Alexandria and 17 of them are spent in exile. But do you know that the sufferings of God's people do not go unnoticed? In fact, the Apostle Paul has the audacity to tell us in Colossians 1 that it is the sufferings and the afflictions of God's people that help promote the truth. And it certainly was the case with Athanasius. His sufferings, his exile, his afflictions would end up making an impact that we feel even to this day. So that if, if you came in here today never having heard of Athanasius, trust me, if you are a Christian today, you have Athanasius' fingerprints on your profession of faith. And that's what God did with this servant of his. Now, let's take a look at the Athanasian Creed. I um, put it on the back of the notes for you so that you can see it. Let's just make a, a few observations and then we're going to look at it. First of all, the Athanasian Creed is like the Apostles' Creed in the sense that it was not really penned by the Apostles, but was thoroughly apostolic. Uh, Athanasius probably did not write this creed, but it certainly is thoroughly Athanasian. Now, there, there's something else about this creed that, that we should note, and that is there really is an emphasis on the intellectual grasp of right belief. Okay? Uh, one church historian says, its defects are the obverse side of its virtues. Uh, it articulates, it defines, it defends the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity, and the humanity of, of the Lord Jesus with power and forcefulness. It, it's really not a creed that is um, recitable. But it is a creed that articulates the truth. Now, can anybody think of perhaps one drawback of having such an emphasis on the proper intellectual grasp of the truth? Elaine? It adds to the word of God. No. Ron? Okay, it is, it is big, and some of the other creeds are short and concise, right? There really is one major drawback, Ken. Right, right. There can be 
there can be this deficiency where you put such an emphasis on the proper intellectual grasp of the truth to the negligence of the heart, right? Now remember, now that's not how Athanasius was. We've already noted that. But the way in which church history unfolds, you can begin to see how exactly that does take place, right? How many of you grew up, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you grew up in traditions where um, becoming a Christian meant that you completed your confirmation class and you were able to answer all the right questions? That's the kind of fruit that we're talking about, where just a pure intellectual grasp of the faith ends up being all that's necessary, and we would say, that's never all that's necessary. The Christian faith is never less than an intellectual grasp of the truth, but it is always more than an intellectual grasp of the truth. Always. We believe in the Holy Spirit who gives us new hearts and who regenerates us, who opens our minds not only to believe the truth intellectually, but to love the truth as well. And so you'll be able to see some of that weakness here. The influences in this uh, creed are obvious. Nicaea, Constantinople, Chalcedon. And although the language bears resemblance, to these prior creeds, it is thoroughly biblical and ends up finding a place of prominence. Let's just go ahead and read through this very quickly. <clears throat> Whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith. And Catholic at that point means what? Universal. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken, will doubtless perish eternally. So it sort of bears that blunt edge of Athanasius right from the beginning, right? Now this is the Catholic or universal faith, that we worship one God in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person, the person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. By the way, some of this very language that comes from the Athanasian Creed is still with us as we define the Trinity, for instance. We say there is one God who exists eternally in one essence and three persons co-equal, co-existing, Co-eternal. That's language that comes right from Athanasian Creed. What equality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet, there are not three eternal beings. There is but one eternal being. So too there are not three uncreated or immeasurable, immeasurable beings, but there is one uncreated and immeasurable being. Similarly, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighty beings, but there's one almighty being. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there are not three gods, but there is one God. Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet there are not three lords, but there is but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or three lords. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. The Holy Spirit was neither created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. By the way, that little paragraph right there has more biblical theology in it than most systematic theologies as a whole. Accordingly, there is one Father, not three fathers. There is one Son, not three sons. There is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Nothing in this trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller. In their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. 
So in everything, as was said earlier, we must worship their trinity in unity and their unity in their trinity. Anyone who then desires to be saved should thus think about the trinity. But it is necessary for eternal salvation that one also believe in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. Now, this is the true faith. That we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father begotten before time, and He is human from the essence of His mother born in time. Completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh, equal to the Father as regards divinity, less than the Father as regards humanity. If you want to understand all of the subordination passages in the Scripture, that one sentence right there will help you. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity turning into, being turned into flesh, but by God's taking humanity to himself. He is one, certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. He suffered for our salvation. He descended to hell. He rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the Father's right hand. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will arise bodily and give an accounting of their deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life. Those who have done evil will enter eternal fire. That, by the way, is simply a paraphrase of John 5, 24. This is the Catholic or universal faith. One cannot be saved without believing it firmly and faithfully. Every year, or I should say now every other year, when I teach the uh, Theology Proper class up in Reno, I, uh, I, I give a, a quiz right b before we actually start the section on the Trinity. I give a quiz on the Trinity. And do you know that without fail, the majority of the students fail the quiz on the Trinity? You believe it? They end up failing the quiz on the tree. It's not a hard quiz. It's not asking, please recite the Athanasian Creed. It's, it's simple type questions. And do you know what ends up happening? Most of them end up being modalists, Sibelians. God is one, existing in three successive modes. I usually ask that. I put that in the form of true or false. Uh, does God uh, exist in three successive modes? Most of them put true. You start to ask questions, and what you realize is that evangelicals do not have a good grasp on the Trinity. Let's get a little closer to home. Even our own prayers sometimes can be Trinitari Trinitarian, Trinitarianly ignorant. When we give thanks to the Father for dying for our sins, for instance, that's wrong. The Father did not come to die for your sins. The Father sent His Son to die for your sins. You see, and so many times the Trinity is very fuzzy in our own minds. And what the Athanasian Creed does is it so beautifully puts, puts forth the unity of the Godhead, but also the distinction of the members of the Godhead. And I would encourage you to take a look at it and to read it and to, and to stop and consider. And some of the language is, is actually quite striking and quite forceful. Well, so far in our study of church history, we've seen two ecumenical councils that have taken place, Nicaea and Constantinople. We've looked at the Athanasian Creed. By the way, the Athanasian Creed does take its place among the ecumenical creeds of the church. And it's very important for us to understand, right up through the end of the 4th century, what was protected. The biblical truth about the person of the Lord Jesus was protected. Also, the biblical truth about the triunity of God was protected. Were there problems in the early church up until the late 4th century? Of course, just like there are problems today. Did they do things that we certainly would not would not have approved of? Of course. These men were not perfect. And remember, the best of men are still men at best. 
But what we need to realize is that those first four centuries were absolutely vital for the growth and the health and the stability of the Christian church because biblical orthodoxy was articulated and defended and won out the day because of the sovereign hand of God.